The Catholic Church was founded by Jesus Christ through his apostles, and from the time of the apostles to the present day, the Church has been governed by an unbroken chain of their lawful successors. This apostolic succession is transmitted through the Sacrament of Holy Orders. There are seven sacraments instituted by Christ. Baptism and matrimony do not absolutely require a priest for the sacrament to be valid. As for the other five sacraments, that is, Confirmation, Penance, Holy Eucharist, Extreme Unction, and Holy Orders. In addition to matter and form, a validly ordained priest or bishop is required. Holy Orders is a sacrament through which men are raised to the priesthood. Therefore, Holy Orders is a sacrament upon which these five sacraments depend. It is worth noting that these are the five sacraments that Protestants reject. Only a bishop can administer the sacrament of holy orders, because only a bishop is in possession of the fullness of the priesthood. Therefore, it is in the bishop that apostolic succession resides. The Catechism of the Council of Trent states, Beyond all doubt, it is to the bishop that the administration of orders belongs, as is easily proven by the authority of Holy Scripture, by most certain tradition, by the testimony of all the fathers, by the decrees of the councils, and by the usage and practice of Holy Church. It is true that permission has been granted to some abbots, occasionally, to administer those orders that are minor and not sacred. Yet there is no doubt whatever that it is the proper office of the bishop, and of the bishop alone, to confer the orders called holy or major. Since a valid Mass requires a validly ordained minister, it is of great concern that in 1968, after the Second Vatican Council had done its work, Paul VI introduced a radically new rite for ordaining priests and bishops. With the introduction of this radically new sacramental rite, it becomes necessary to ask the question, what is necessary to confect a valid sacrament? To have a valid sacrament, one must have valid matter and form. The matter of the sacrament is the visible element such as water, oil, bread, wine, or in the case of holy orders, the matter consists in a ritual of the imposition or laying out of hands. The form of the sacrament is the words that accompany the matter. For example, in the case of baptism, the form would be, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. To pour water over someone's head can mean any number of things. It could be done to give someone a bath, or perhaps to wake them up. It is therefore the words of the form that determine what the application of the matter will be. This is why it is only when the matter is accompanied by the corresponding form that a sacrament can be confected. Pope Leo XIII, Apostolic C. Curie, on the validity of Anglican orders. Although the signification ought to be found in the whole essential rite, that is to say, in the matter and the form, it still pertains chiefly to the form, since the matter is the part which is not determined by itself, but which is determined by the form. And this appears still more clearly in the sacrament of orders, the matter of which, in so far as we have to consider it in this case, is the imposition of hands, which indeed by itself signifies nothing definite, and is equally used for several orders and for confirmation. Although there are problems with the new rite for ordaining priests and bishops, since it is in the bishop that apostolic succession resides, it is the rite for the consecration of a bishop that is most critical. In Paul VI's new rite for ordaining bishops, they maintain the matter of the sacrament, which is the laying on of hands. However, they radically change the form. In fairness, it must be noted that a change in the form does not automatically invalidate a sacrament. Christ did not give us the exact form for the consecration of a bishop. However, because it is the words of the form that determine the application of the matter, 
although the words of the form may vary, they must contain the same substantial meaning that Christ established. Pius XII makes this point in his apostolic constitution, Sacramentum Ordinis. He writes, As the Council of Trent teaches, the seven sacraments of the new law were all instituted by Jesus Christ our Lord, and the Church has no power over the substance of the sacraments, that is, over those things which, with the source of divine revelation as a witness, Christ the Lord himself decreed to be preserved in a sacramental sign. The Church has the right to make changes to her liturgy, provided that those changes do not alter the substance of the sacrament. Therefore, the question to be asked is, does the form in Paul VI's new rite for ordaining bishops change the substance of the sacrament? In other words, does the form in Paul VI's new rite have the same meaning as the form in the traditional rite? To answer this question, consider the forms of the two rites side by side. The form for the consecration of a bishop in the traditional rite. Complete in thy priest the fullness of thy ministry, and having clothed him with all splendor, sanctify him by the dew of heavenly anointing. The form for the ordination of a bishop in Paul the Sixth New Rite. Pour out now upon these chosen ones that power which is from you, the governing spirit, whom you gave to your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, the spirit whom you bestowed upon the holy apostles, who established the church in each place as your sanctuary for the glory and unceasing praise of your name. Do these two forms mean the same thing? In the traditional rite we have, complete in thy priest the fullness of thy ministry, while in the new rite we have, pour forth upon this chosen one that power which is from you, the governing spirit. Does the phrase governing spirit mean the same thing as being filled with the fullness of the priesthood? It is not exactly clear what governing spirit actually means. It could be understood to mean several different things. Does it mean that the person to be ordained will be raised to the fullness of the priesthood? Or does governing spirit mean that the person is appointed as a kind of overseer for the flock? In typical modernist fashion, the meaning of governing spirit is left deliberately unclear. It is a basic principle of sacramental theology that the form must be clear and have only one possible meaning. In Pius XII's Apostolic Constitution, Sacramentum Ordinis, he lays out the requirements for the form used in the Sacrament of Holy Orders. He writes, The form, and only the form, is the words which determine the application of this matter, which univocally signify the sacramental effect, namely, the power of order and the grace of the Holy Spirit. Pius XII tells us that the form for the consecration of a bishop must signify the sacramental effect, namely, the power of order and the grace of the Holy Ghost. And this signification must be univocal, that is to say, it must have only one possible meaning. Um, so we went from that to governing spirit. Yeah. So that was the, 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 the phrase that we're looking at, but this is still not um, univocal by definition. And, and why would you argue that? Father. Well, what does it mean? Uh, the the uh, how is that uh, to be understood? You know. Uh, well, you know, a uh, bishop governs the church. A governing the, spirit. Yeah, uh, Joe that? Biden governs the Senate, maybe, <laughs> and and he's got the governing spirit. <laughs> but it's not the problem. Is it's not standard theological language that tells you what uh, a bishop does. If anything, all it it it, it doesn't convey the uh, idea of a sacrament as much as it, it, it might convey the idea of some sort of a jurisdiction, which uh, obviously a bishop has, but that's not the whole story. And you talked about having a dozen possible meetings uh, for governing spirit. Where were some of your sources for these meetings? Oh, before? well, I mean, uh, you, uh, again, it was a real rabbit hole. Uh, you uh, found the different explanations that, say, Dom Bott tried to give uh, in uh, his, his explanation in Otizia magazine. Uh, you uh, look at how it's understood in Psalm 50, uh, where, uh, where it occurs. The, uh, you see maybe how different fathers of the church used it. 
And uh, what happens is I went through a whole bunch of them, at least a dozen, all these different sources. And I went through a dozen sources and came up with a dozen different meanings. So you, you end up with language in the essential sacramental form for Episcopal consecration, where it is, is uh, virtually impossible to say with certainty and affirm with a straight face uh, what it actually means. The meaning of governing spirit may be unclear. However, Paul VI's new rite does still contain the terms bishop and high priest. Grant, O Father, knower of all hearts, that these your servants, whom you've chosen for the office of bishop, may shepherd your holy people, serving you night and day. May they fulfill before you without reproach the ministry of the high priesthood. This does not help the validity of the new ordination rite for two reasons. First, the terms bishop and high priest are not part of the essential sacramental form, and second, the term bishop must possess the Catholic understanding of a bishop. The surrounding ceremonies of the new rite have been stripped of every reference to the Catholic understanding of a bishop. Nowhere in the new rite is the power of a Catholic bishop clearly specified outside of his role in governing the flock. Consider that the Anglican Church also claims to have priests and bishops. The Reformers in England composed new ordination rites that maintain the titles priest and bishop. However, the new ordination rite must be in agreement with the 39 articles of the Anglican faith. Among other things, these 39 articles specifically deny the Catholic concept of a bishop. The Anglican rite makes it clear that although they use the terms priest and bishop, these terms mean entirely different things to the Anglicans than they do to the Catholics. Consider the words of Pope Leo XIII in Apostolic G. Curie, on the validity of Anglican orders. Any words in the Anglican ordinal, as it now is, which lend themselves to ambiguity, cannot be taken in the same sense as they possess in the Catholic rite, for once a new rite has been introduced, in which, as we have seen, the sacrament of orders is adulterated or denied, and from which all idea of consecration and sacrifice has been rejected, the formula, receive the Holy Ghost, no longer holds good, because the Spirit is infused into the soul with the grace of the sacrament, and so the words for the office and work of a priest or bishop and the like no longer hold good, but remain as words without the reality which Christ instituted. The Anglican rite of ordination mimics the Catholic rite. However, as Pope Leo XIII points out, the term bishop has an entirely different meaning for the Anglicans than it does for the Catholics. This becomes evident from an examination of the surrounding ceremonies of the Anglican Rite, from which has been deliberately removed every reference to the Catholic understanding of a bishop. Paul VI, new Episcopal Rite of Ordination, does exactly the same thing as the Anglican Rite. It maintains the titles Bishop and High Priest, but removes from the surrounding ceremony every reference to the Catholic understanding of a bishop. This new rite brings the role of a bishop in line with the Protestant understanding of a bishop. The role of a bishop has been reduced to that of an overseer, who is ordained to preside over the liturgy. Consider some of the more notable changes to the surrounding ceremony of Paul VI's new rite. The first problem is the consecrator's homily is given under the heading, Consent of the People. With their applause, the people give their assent to the Pope's choosing of bishops elect Reed and O'Connor to their new office. The idea that a bishop is appointed by the consent of the people is an entirely Protestant concept. A Catholic bishop is appointed by the authority of the Pope, who represents Jesus Christ on earth. Did Jesus Christ ask the Jews for their consent when he appointed his apostles? Should the teacher ask for the consent of the student? The traditional rite of Episcopal consecration begins with an oath. At this time, the bishop-elect will kneel at the foot of the altar before Bishop Carmona and take his oath 
which is a profession of faith, to be faithful to the Holy Catholic faith. In this oath, the candidate swears, among other things, I shall observe with all my strength, and I shall cause to be observed by others, the rules of the Holy Fathers, the apostolic decrees, ordinances or dispositions, reservations, provisions, and mandates. This oath is totally omitted in the new rite. One would be hard-pressed to find a bishop in the new church who would even attempt to cause anyone to observe any rules. Now that he has completed the oath, the bishop-elect returns to his place and is seated, and the examination begins. Wilt thou reverently receive, teach, and keep the traditions of the Orthodox Fathers and the decrees of the Holy Apostolic See? To each question, the bishop-elect rising and responding, I will. The Examination in Paul VI, New Rite. You resolve to guard the deposit of faith entire and incorrupt, as handed down by the apostles, preserved in the church everywhere and at all times. I do. In the traditional rite we have, will you keep and teach with reverence the traditions of the Orthodox Fathers and the doctrinal constitutions of the Holy and Apostolic See, while in the new rite we have, will you maintain the deposit of faith entire and incorrupt as handed down by the apostles? On the surface, this prayer in the new rite sounds orthodox. However, it has been stripped of anything to which the Protestants can object. Remember that the Protestants claim to hold the faith handed down by the apostles. They claim that it is the Catholic Church that has corrupted the faith of the apostles by adding the traditions of men. Therefore, to make the office of bishop acceptable to the Protestants, the promise to keep and teach the traditions of the Orthodox Fathers and the Apostolic See had to go. The examination continues in the traditional rite. The bishop-elect is asked to profess his belief in every article of the creed. Dost thou believe that the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church is the one true Church in which the one true baptism is given and the true remission of all sins? I do believe. Professing a belief in every article of the creed had to go in the new rite. How could a novice ordo bishop profess a belief in the unity of the church when Vatican II openly denies the unity of the church by teaching that the true church only subsists in the Catholic Church? Continuing with the examination in the traditional rite, the bishop is asked, Dost thou also condemn every heresy which lifteth itself up against this holy Catholic Church. I do. The duty of a bishop to condemn heresy is omitted in the new rite. No bishop in the new church would ever condemn anyone. Rather than condemning, bishops in the new church go out of their way to embrace heretics. I mean, people throw the word heresy around like, you know, it was... Uh, you know, a rash or something, you know, that you could think. <laughs> Heresy, in my mind, is an unwillingness to live with complexity. In the traditional rite, the consecrator instructs the bishop-elect on the duties and powers of a Catholic bishop. The consecrator now addresses the bishop-elect as follows. <clears throat> it is the duty of a bishop to judge, to expound, to consecrate, to ordain, to offer sacrifice, to baptize, and to confirm. This entire prayer is omitted from the new rite. It is indeed most significant that the power to ordain and confirm has been removed from the new rite, for these are powers that are unique to the office of a bishop. Furthermore, it is of interest that the bishop's duty to judge has also been removed from the new rite. The unusually frank press conference on the flight home from Brazil covered a lot of ground over 80 minutes. But most of the press corps reported this quote from the Pope. If someone is gay and he searches for the Lord and has good will, who am I to judge? The bishop's duty to judge had to be removed from the new rite, for no novus ordo bishop would ever judge anyone. Next we have the Litany of the Saints. The Litany of the Saints was maintained in the New Rite, however, even with the Litany, they did make a few changes.
Prayer that follows the anointing of the bishop's head with oil in the traditional rite. Give to him, O Lord, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, that he may employ without ostentation the power which thou dost impart for edification and not for destruction. Whatsoever he shall bind on earth, be it bound also in heaven. And whatsoever he shall loose on earth, be it loosed also in heaven. Whose sins he shall retain, be they retained. And whose sins he shall remit, may they by thee be remitted. This prayer has been entirely omitted in the New Rite. However, the New Rite does mention the power to forgive sins in the consecration prayer. Granted by the power of the Spirit of the High Priesthood, they may have the power to forgive sins according to your command, assign offices according to your decree, and loose every bond according to the power given by you to the apostles. However, as a priest, he would already have the power to forgive sins, and so there is nothing in this prayer to indicate the unique power of a Catholic bishop. Indeed, every power unique to a Catholic bishop has been stripped from the new rite. Also note that in the traditional rite the prayer states, Whatsoever he shall bind on earth, be it bound also in heaven, and whatsoever he shall loose on earth, be it loosed also in heaven. However, in the new rite, the prayer only mentions the bishop's power to loose every bond, but not his power to bind. Getting a marriage annul can be a complicated process, but Pope Francis wants to make it easier. According to an announcement from the Vatican, the Holy Father appointed a commission to simplify the annulment of Catholic marriages. A Novus Ordo Bishop will loose you to do whatever you would like, but he will never bind you to your obligation to be Catholic. The prayer that follows the anointing of the bishop's head with oil continues in the traditional rite. May he never put light for darkness, nor darkness for light. May he never call evil good, nor good evil. Cardinal Timothy Dolan celebrated the inclusion of homosexuals in Thursday's St. Patrick's Day Parade. After Mayor Bill de Blasio dropped his boycott and marched in the parade, Dolan embraced de Blasio and said he's thrilled decades of division have been overcome. Cardinal Timothy Dolan, Archbishop of New York, not only applauded the decision, but gladly accepted an invitation to serve as the parade's Grand Marshal. May he never call evil good, nor good evil. Do you think that the faithful are more accepting of those marchers in the parade in 2017? I do, I think, and I think a good chunk of them were two years ago in the height of it. May he never call evil good, nor good evil. Whether the, the Catholic Church should welcome gay people into their communities. Look, you're talking to the Archbishop of New York. I find it news that some people would still consider this news. May he never call evil good, nor good evil. These are ancient Christian communities. They'd every every right in the world to curse God. They'd every every right in the world to say, God has let us down. This prayer had to go in the new rite. For calling evil good and good evil seems to be the job description of a Novus Ordo Bishop. The prayer that follows the anointing of the bishop's head with oil continues in the traditional rite. Devote him, O Lord, to the Episcopal chair to rule thy church and the flock committed to him. This entire prayer has been removed from the new rite. In typical modernist fashion, through omission and ambiguity, the innovators were able to eliminate the Catholic concept of a bishop without openly denying it. In the new rite, as in the Protestant rite, the bishop's function has been reduced to that of an overseer. This is not to say that a bishop does not have such a function, the objection is to a right that reduces the function of a bishop to that of only an overseer. The ceremony for the consecration of a bishop is a long and complex ritual, and the issues of the validity of Paul VI's new right may seem to be beyond the grasp of the average Catholic. However, the rules governing sacramental theology are fairly straightforward on what is required for a valid sacrament. Pius XII tells us that the form for the consecration of a bishop must clearly signify the sacramental effect, namely, the power of order and the grace of the Holy Ghost. It follows, therefore, that the form for the ordination of a bishop in Paul VI's new rite cannot be valid because the form does not signify the power of a bishop. In fact, it is not clear exactly what the new form actually does signify. 
So you, you end up with language in the essential sacramental form for Episcopal consecration, where it is, is uh, virtually impossible to say with certainty and affirm with a straight face uh, what it actually means. Without a valid form, no sacrament can be valid. An Episcopal consecration that does not have a form which unambiguously states that the candidate will be raised to the fullness of the priesthood is no more valid than a baptism that does not contain the baptismal formula. Furthermore, even with the use of proper matter and form, if a sacrament is performed in a setting that denies the very nature of the sacrament, that sacrament is invalid. Consider the words of Pope Leo XIII in his bull, Apostola Curie on the invalidity of Anglican orders. He writes, For to put aside other reasons which show this to be insufficient for the purpose in the Anglican rite, let this argument suffice for all. From them has been deliberately removed whatever sets forth the dignity and office of the priesthood in the Catholic rite. That form consequently cannot be considered apt or sufficient for the sacrament, which omits what it ought essentially to signify. The deliberate removal of the Catholic concept of a bishop from the surrounding ceremonies of Paul VI's new ordination rite appears to follow the same pattern that the Anglicans used to compose their new rites. The term bishop is still employed. However, just as in the Anglican rite, every reference to the duties, function, and power of a Catholic bishop has been deliberately removed. This is a denial of the very nature of the sacrament. As Pope Leo XIII points out, that form cannot be considered as apt or sufficient for a sacrament which omits what it ought essentially to signify. The substantial meaning of the rite has been entirely removed and replaced with the Protestant one, leaving us with a rite that is almost indistinguishable from the Anglican rite. Keep in mind that Pope Leo XIII declared Anglican orders to be invalid in his apostolic bull, Apostolic Curie. He writes, We pronounce and declare that ordinations carried out according to the Anglican rite have been and are absolutely null and utterly void. There is more than sufficient evidence to conclude that the new ordination rite is invalid. However, whether one believes the rite to be valid or not, all must confess that there is at least a doubt as to its validity. It is a basic principle of sacramental theology that it is sinful for a Catholic to receive a doubtful sacrament. Therefore, doubt is enough to require Catholics to reject it. Would you go to confession to a priest who told you, your sins are probably forgiven you? Or receive communion from a priest who says, this is probably the body of Christ? Probably is just not good enough for a sacrament. Street.